Now we're thrilled to be joined by Cecilia Kong. Cecilia's latest book, which she co-authored with Shira Frankel, is An Ugly Truth Inside Facebook's Battle for Domination. Cecilia covers technology and regulatory policy for the New York Times, and she's based in Washington, DC. Before joining the paper in 2015, she reported on technology and business for the Washington Post for 10 years. Her co-writer, Shira Frankel, covers cybersecurity from San Francisco for the New York Times, and previously she spent over a decade in the Middle East as a foreign correspondent, reporting for BuzzFeed, NPR, The Times of London, and McClatchy. Both Shira and Cecilia were a part of a team of investigative journalists recognized in 2019 as finalists for the Pulitzer Prize for natu National Reporting. The team has also won a, the George Polk Award for National Reporting and the Gerald Loeb Award for Investigative Reporting. Cecilia, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So, um, Cecilia, I'm so, this is, I feel like this topic is always, it's always timely, but it feels especially juicy right now, in mm. part because whistleblower Francis Haugen recently released tens of thousands of pages of internal Facebook documents. And among other issues, these documents indicate that Facebook has knowingly perpetuated misinformation and harmed the mental health of teenagers on Instagram, just in the interest of profit. And they also show how the company helped fuel the January 6th insurrection. And your book, An Ugly Truth, details Facebook's long history of company over country, which was, as you've written, one of Zuckerberg's early mantras. And can you talk a little bit about that history? Yeah, I think you really have to go back to the beginning to understand why Facebook is at where it is today. And a lot of that has to do with the ambitions of its leaders and also the business model that they built, that they created. Um, this expression, company over country, came from um, the earlier days when Mark Zuckerberg would end his meetings with staff saying company over country, um, according to one of his speechwriters, Kate Lossie, who also wrote a book um, we talked to. And um, what he meant by that was that he understood he was building something so powerful and so big and so new that in many ways, it would be almost a government of its own. It would be as impactful and as, as powerful um, as like a nation state. Um, and his message really there was to say, look, we are competitive. We want to be big. We want to have impact with the capital I in this world. So this is company first, everybody. Let's all get in it. We're all in. So that was his message. And I think that that message, you know, has had a lot of resonance in different ways, perhaps in ways he didn't expect um, today. But um, but I think there's been a lot of a lot of the tone was set in the very beginning with that kind of ambition. In some ways, it's sort of like he could have had his mantra be uh, the company is the country. Right. <laughs> you know? um, anyway, since The Wall Street Journal first published the Facebook files in early September, practically every major news outlet has analyzed and reported on those documents, including uh, you for the New York Times. Uh, as a journalist who's been covering Facebook for over 15 years now, can you describe what your initial reaction was to the release of these documents and what you predict their long-term impact will be? Yeah, I mean, I was surprised on the one hand by just how comprehensive and how much Francis Haugen had um, retrieved with these tens of thousands of pages of documents that showed um, themes and showed um, and illustrated issues that were not surprising. And let me explain that. I think a lot of what was um, revealed in these documents that she took from Facebook supported, first of all, so much of our reporting in our book um, and the underlying um, message being that the company has made growth its number one priority and that there has been a pattern within the company where employees um, in many different parts of the country are continuously sounding alarm bells and warnings of um, warning of problems that exist as it as, as pertaining to misinformation, to hate speech, to data privacy problems, and that message just not being heard enough by the top leaders, and the top leaders not doing enough to change and to address these these warnings and these problems. So um, I think that the 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 leaks the revelations have been incredibly impactful in that it provided such a comprehensive view of just how the company works from the inside and how the leadership of Facebook especially Mark Zuckerberg the CEO is calling a lot of the shots and not putting in some cases security first um, over this drive for growth um, you know I think the impact of this is to be determined really is TBD because 
in the moment a few weeks ago when Francis Haugen, the whistleblower, was testifying before the Senate, it seemed like things were really going to change. It seemed like that was just like the worst existential crisis moment for Facebook. And we had lawmakers sort of vociferously waving their hands saying, this is a big tobacco moment for Facebook and big tech and things are going to really change. And have you heard a lot since? I mean, I, I'm not going to say that things won't change and there won't be some sort of momentum for legislative action, but I do think that it's the, the questions on what to do next and to hold Facebook accountable are hard, they're thorny, and they haven't changed in the last few years. And I think lawmakers are really grappling with what to do. Um, so the impact really is to be determined. I wonder if I'm thinking, I mean, maybe I'm thinking about this too simplistically, but I'm just so curious, like as a writer, Whitney and I are both former journalists and thinking about what is the moment when you who have been covering Facebook for 15 years are kind of like, this is the moment that I have to stop writing. Cause I know that when I have a book yanked away from me, it must be so much harder for you because every second there's breaking news. And then simultaneously, there's this fascinating coverage problem, which you just referenced, right? That the problem doesn't change also kind of for 15 years. I don't know. Is that, is that fair? Oh my and God, totally how do you as a writer contend with this? Yeah, I totally, you, you know, the, you know, you nailed this on the head. I, for us, one of the biggest challenges among the many challenges we had in reporting and writing this book was knowing when to stop because we were covering the story. We were writing this and figuring out what the book would be in real time. You know, we actually went through several versions of what we thought our core arguments would be before we thought, you know, early on, we thought this is going to be a book about domination and antitrust and data privacy. And then we realized, oh no, this is really shifted toward like speech and misinformation. Then we realized, oh my goodness, it's actually all of these things. So what's the underlying problem? Like, is there sort of like a systemic underlying problem of Facebook? And that was a good animating question because that got us to our final, <laughs> what, what we finally concluded would be the theme, which is to look at how the business model, the technology has led and has sort of sparked a lot of these problems. And the priority of growth has been sort of the underlying problem within the company. Um, so with that in mind, once we figured out what the sort of bedrock problems were of Facebook and what our bedrock arguments would be, then we realized it doesn't really matter when we stop because they'll all kind of come back to this, <laughs> this foundational issue that we're exploring, which is you know the business model. So that made it a little bit easier and made us feel like, okay, no matter what happens next, we feel like this will still have like long life, the, 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 our central arguments, because that is the core problem. Yeah. I mean, I you say the only... problem is growth, right? But when I listen to stock shows, that's the thing that's good about Facebook, right? The reason that Facebook is, is going to be able to weather these problems, I think, is because if you listen to investors and you listen to Wall Street, they're like, look, it's growing. And we think that this stuff, regular story stuff will, will blow over and you should invest there. People still, like the minute that this story drops, the coverage on a place like CNBC is totally different than it is in regular, in, in, you know, in media that I you know, normally read like the Times, right? And so you'll hear people on like Fast Money, which is a show that is on every night, say like, yeah, this has happened before. Nothing will change. Their PE ratio is 25. It's a good investment. You should buy it. You know, yeah. I mean, I I think problem is in the eye of the beholder, right? Like what a problem is. Like if you're an investor, you see no problems in the the actual returns you're getting from the share price. If you're concerned about societal problems, and if you're concerned about genocide in Myanmar, if you're concerned about election, you know, misinformation and and health misinformation around the COVID vaccines, then that's a different sort of view on what the problem is. So there is absolutely, and I think you're pointing to something that's really important, which is there's a really big disconnect be, uh, with, or a delta, I should say, with the, the scrutiny of the company and the reputational damage of the company, given just like story after story. And now five years running um, revelations of just really systemic problems within the company with, in terms of these bigger societal problems, and then this business that's just operating fantastically and super successful. So, I mean, that's this crazy disconnect that happens right now. You see shareholders who say internally, who are activist shareholders who are trying to change things, but they have no power. Mark Zuckerberg has really all the power on the stock side. So, I mean, the reason why I think this Delta is, 
particularly important is that there's not a lot of incentive for the company to change dramatically a business model that is so successful. And so this Delta is, you know, so the, the question is what will incentivize the company to truly put like much more into security and safety? They do put a lot in, but not nearly enough given its scale. Stock price loss would do it or loss of users. I think I just think that's the only thing. I mean, the only the only thing that's interesting from stock analysts is that you'll say, well, if they get listed as an ESG, as, as they, if they're no longer mm-hmm. be able, able to be included in ESG investing as a like an oil and gas company, but they're like the, the oil and gas equivalent of like the social political world, like they're toxic, then that might change things. Well, look, you know, and I think that people forget that the environmental movement, like to your point about oil and gas, as well as like tobacco, um, a lot of these, a lot of the consumer changes that occurred were slow and over many years, but they did change. And people did change their habits when it came to, you know, recycling, eating and being less wasteful, thinking about the environment, certainly when it came to health related to cigarettes. So it's consumer behavior is the big, the big existential threat for sure, for a company like Facebook. But so far, there's not, um, a, the, the movement is there, actually. We're seeing younger people leave Facebook and Instagram, for sure, which is definitely keeping Mark Zuckerberg up at night. But it's it'll be slow. And that's why I think they're going headlong and so fast into new things like metaverse. So going back a little bit to the topic of whistleblowers, your your book, yeah. and I'm and I'm quoting here from the author's note, draws on never reported emails, memos, and white papers. I can't tell you how much I wish as a writer that I had been like, I don't know, I'm imagining you and Shira in a, in a room with a long table organizing your book, and I just can't imagine what it looked like. Um, and that the book is also, and I'm quoting again, the product of more than a thousand hours of interviews with more yeah. than 400 people, many of whom are executives, investors, or current employees. I'm so curious to hear what it was like working with internal sources, especially some of the high level executives, given how, as your book depicts, Facebook has been strict, I would dare even say authoritarian when it comes to protecting internal data. And there is even mention in your book of employees having to sign additional NDAs and mousetraps left around the company to Mm -hmm. test employee loyalties. And I wonder if you can discuss those security measures and what you had to do to work around them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a reason why... um... So many people talk to us and I think it's because they trust us. And we've been doing this for a long time as well. Like Shira has been, I think her first encounter report of reporting on Facebook was um, around 2011. She covered the Arab Spring and, you know, social media in, in Tahir Square. For me, I think- Those were the days. And for me, my first, I think my first interview with Zuckerberg was in 2009 or 2010. So we've been doing this for a long time. So we know a lot of people and we come in sort of in different ways. So there's that, but there um, there are no shortcuts. It's just really, really hard. And I will say that we have dozens of whistleblowers who talk to us. Like if you think about the definition of a whistleblower, which is people who are willing to talk about what they believe is the truth and to give us really information that's really hard to get and information that it oftentimes completely contradicts what the company is presenting publicly. So we had many people. And I think um, one reason why they trust us is because we're super careful, you know, and I would say even from the beginning of our reporting process, which is in 2018, 2019 to today, more people at Facebook internally are willing to speak out you know, I mean, it was remarkable that Frances Haugen came out publicly, but we know that there were some whistleblowers who came out publicly before her too, but that was really rare. And like five years ago, nobody leaked at Facebook. So this just was, it was, it was showing and proving that we knew how to be careful and we knew how to trust our source like for our sources. We knew how to protect them. So like, I'll just give really small examples. It's like saying like, look, before we meet, meet, you really should delete your, you know, your Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp apps off your phone because if your location tracking is there, then they may not, you know, they'll have some sort of potential record on you going to the same Starbucks that I was at, you know, at the same time, and they can put two to do together, like that kind of a conversation. And these are typically sophisticated people who didn't even need that kind of prompting or guidance. Another example is just to like, you know, be very careful and. You know, I see this all the time where somebody will say, well, you know, 
Whitney told me to talk to, you know, to talk to you because Whitney says, you know, so much about this topic. I mean, that is like an absolute violation of trust. You know, that's the kind of thing that you never do. And if I was that source, I would say, well, you know, screw you, Whitney, and I'm not going to talk to you either, reporter, you know, that kind of a thing. It's just like that kind of common sense stuff, just being very careful. And then um, on, a, on a really practical matter, I think you cannot underestimate um, the power of just trying to get the um, good and, and um, important information out and that people just want that to happen. And what I mean by that is like, if we just... And we do this all the time if we, when we explain our intention to our sources, you know, this is what our book attempts to do. Our book attempts to be you know, very comprehensive, to look back at the business model, to really explore and to educate the public on why we're seeing all these problems at Facebook. That's very different than going in and just saying, you know, I want to know everything that happened in your department and, you know, tell me about every, you know, everything that every executive did because I want to, you know, to present sort of a gotcha kind of potential book or a story. And I think that that instills a lot of trust when you explain a lot. And if you give your sources a, a feeling that they can be confident that there's this information is in the right hands. This is a technical question, but I mean, you know, we're interested in the, the, those parts of reporting. Like you have these scenes that, you know, are, are meetings that are happening with all, all these people, right? So how do you go about saying, how do you go about dramatizing a meeting like that? Do you need two different yeah. sources that say that the meeting happened and that these things were said? How do you fact check all that stuff? And how do you, I know that Times is really good at fact checking and I've written for them before myself, but without divulging any like important, you know, source material, you know, like how does that work when you're recreating these scenes? Yeah. And so great question. First of all, we had a fact checker. We had um, two fact checkers that whom we hired to work with somebody appointed at Facebook to just receive the fact checks from us. So there was, right. there was a very professional process that took about three months, more than three months, actually. So there was, we presented them with just so many data points, hundreds of data points that we wanted to vet through and just like give them a chance to respond to. Um, some were really like basic facts, like, you know, dates and stuff like that, but others were like bigger scenes and like, you know, what, what many people in a room gathered was the intention of somebody. And then we give them, we wanted to give Facebook the chance to really respond to these things. So this sort of no surprises process is something that we do at the times. And it's something that we did with this book as well. So we felt very, very good about the fact checking process. When it comes to each of these scenes, none of those scenes are single source. There's no way we would do that. That's just like, we can't, you know, um, but I don't want to get too much into detail because I think some scenes, as you can imagine, um, there are there are different there are there are a different number of people who might be knowledgeable about a particular scene. So it's you know I don't want to say too much about right. this. But nothing is single source. Most things are multiply sourced, and I don't mean just like two you know people. So it's it's really and it's and it's what we do is we try not to be leading also is and say you know you know, I heard that, you know, Zuckerberg was wearing a green sweater in this meeting. We want to say like, you know, this is a small example, but like, what was he wearing? So that we have three people who will say like, oh, you know, he was wearing a green sweater. So we don't right. want to be like leading and say like, we heard that the sweater had buttons. Is that right? And then, yeah, I think that's right. I, you know, that kind of, a, you know, we want to just make sure that it's, we're not leading and that we're getting fresh information. We don't want to get too much into anyone's head unless we have, we feel very, very confident about the retelling of this, of a person's thoughts and emotions directly from that person to other people, or that that person told us. So I don't hope that makes sense. So we don't want to, you know, again, I'm, I'm speaking somewhat in code because we have to be careful, but um, that's not our business to, you know, if we, if we had not heard um, many people say, well, so-and-so said that, he was, he felt completely, you know, um, frustrated and angry, then, you know, then that's, then we have a good sense that, you know, that person felt pretty frustrated and angry. And then we gave, we give them a chance to respond. Facebook at the end is saying, we understand that this person felt very frustrated and angry. Does that sound right? So you can imagine that everything in the book has been vetted in that way. 
That's so helpful. And Asugi and I know how this works, but I feel like one of the problems with like the way that people talk about journalism these days is that people don't actually know what fact checking looks like at a level that you're doing, right? For for any story, though. I mean, people just don't understand the journalistic process. So that was really wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. So Cecilia, the further I make it into the book, the more Zuckerberg seems like he's evolving from smart asshole to authoritarian overlord. And we see this in the security measures we just discussed and also in his handling of anything beyond himself and his company. And when it comes to competition, he either just annihilates other companies or acquires them. Uh, and when it comes to genocide in Myanmar and hate speech, he allows these issues to worsen in support of growth. And he's always been a ruthless business person, but I think the last six years have marked a huge shift, not just in the public's trust of Facebook, but it seems like also in company morale, um, that kind of flood of people coming forward that you mentioned. And even some of his longtime friends and founding members have turned their backs on him in recent years. I wonder if you could discuss that development a little bit or, or whatever the opposite of development is as a leader. Yeah, I mean, I think Mark Zuckerberg has been remarkably consistent. You know, um, I think the very competitive and um, very confident person who you see today is the same person who started Facebook in 2004. All the same ingredients were there. Um, we also see somebody who, um, who has not lived a lot of life, frankly, from you know, going from Dobbs Ferry, his family home, to Exeter, to Harvard, to Silicon Valley, and getting funded right away, and sticking with this one company—that's that's he's had one job, right? Um, and he has not had a lot of experience. And the reason why I mentioned this is that um, you know he he leads a website that reaches more than three billion people around the world. And I think that, you know, you mentioned, Sugi, the Myanmar and India and some of these other countries where, um, in Ethiopia, where we're seeing a complete, just such a mismatch of their ambition to be in those countries with the amount of security that they put into um, making sure that the users in those countries are protected. It's just so little compared to how much they want to be in these countries and how many people adopt the, the, um, the service that um, so that it matters that the leader of Facebook um, does not understand life outside um, in any ways the worlds that he's lived in. Um, he, I think it's been very, very hard for him to, um, to see people like Chris Hughes, one of his co-founders and Harvard classmate, classmates, Harvard roommate, in fact, um, become one of the most um, vocal critics of Facebook. In fact, saying that he believes Facebook should be um, broken up. And we have a scene in the book where, where when Chris Hughes' op-ed in the New York Times calling for the breakup of Facebook, his first release, this was around May of 2019, Zuckerberg was in Paris. Um, he had a meeting with Macron um, and he was writing around and he first heard about it. And we, we had, you know, in our reporting, we learned that he was incredibly mad and frustrated um, because of Chris Hughes's arguments, but mostly because it was a friend and somebody who was there in the beginning, who Zuckerberg felt betrayed him, you know, felt that it was like a real um, sort of stabbing of the bat in the back kind of moment. Um, and loyalty matters to Mark Zuckerberg and to Sheryl Sandberg and to a lot of other people there. People stay there much longer than arguably they should, according to many employees, because Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg are loyal to them. Um, they themselves are loyal to each other. Um, so that matters. So when, when people do turn and they become public and vocal um, critics of the company, Zuckerberg not only um, finds that frustrating, I think he finds that like a personal betrayal. I think this is a great point uh, for us to hear from the book directly, if you, if you would be willing to read a passage yeah, for us. Sure. Great. This chapter is called The Coalition of the Willing. Zuckerberg, sorry. Zuckerberg was fuming as he rode through the streets of Paris in a chauffeured black Mercedes V-Class MVP. He furiously scanned an article on his phone. The afternoon rain showers had just let up and the walkways along the Seine were teeming with pedestrians. He was in France to meet Prime Minister Emmanuel Macron to discuss a surge in violence and hate speech on Facebook. 
It was the last leg of a global diplomatic offensive to defend the platform and to try to influence regulations under consideration in several nations. In the past five weeks, he had talked with government leaders in Ireland, Germany, and New Zealand. Zuckerberg had aged visibly over the past year. His face was thinner, accentuated by his close cropped haircut. The fine lines circled his red rimmed eyes. His visit with Macron was the last hurdle to clear before he took a break from a grueling year of, up, up, of upheaval inside and outside of the company. He and Priscilla would celebrate Mother's Day at the Louvre before heading to Greece for their seven year, their seven year wedding anniversary. But an op-ed published in the New York Times had interrupted his plans. Chris Hughes, Zuckerberg's Harvard roommate and a co-founder of Facebook had delivered a scathing 5,000 word rebuke of the company they had created together in their dorm room 15 years earlier. In the piece, Hughes talked about their idealism in starting Facebook, but what they created, he wrote, had evolved into something much darker. The social network had become a dangerous monopoly with 80% of the world's social networking revenue and a bottomless appetite for personal data. It is time to break up Facebook, he said. The core problem was Zuckerberg, Hughes asserted. He made the big decisions and held a majority stake in the company voting shares. Mark was Facebook and Facebook was Mark. And as long as he main, remained in charge, the only solution for the company's many problems was for, was for the government to intervene and break the company into pieces. I'm angry that his focus on growth led him to sacrifice security and civility for clicks. I'm disappointed in myself and the early Facebook team for not thinking more about how the newsfeed algorithm would, would change our culture, influence elections, and empower nationalist leaders, Hughes concluded in the op-ed. The government must hold Mark accountable. Zuckerberg's expression hardened as he scrolled through the piece. He kept his gaze fixed on the phone, not uttering a word. After several minutes of silence, he looked up solemnly without blinking, with unblinking eyes. He told his aides he felt stabbed in the back. And then he kicked into commander mode. How, he demanded, had the op-ed slipped through Facebook's army of PR staffers responsible for sniffing out negative articles? Whom had, had Hughes consulted in researching his critique? And what did he hope to achieve? Within the hour, Facebook's PR team went on the offensive. Hughes hadn't been employed at Facebook for a decade, they told reporters. He didn't know how the company worked anymore. They questioned his motives and criticized the Times' decision to publish a piece without giving Zuckerberg a chance to defend the company and himself. Chris wants to get into politics, a Facebook flack informed a New York Times journalist. But Hughes wasn't acting alone. He had joined a growing number of early Facebook executives, including former president Sean Parker, who were speaking out admonishing the social network they had helped build and they had brought and that had brought them individual wealth. He was also bringing energy into a movement in Washington disma to dismantle the social media giant. Political leaders, academics, and consumer activists were calling for the government to break off WhatsApp and Instagram, the fastest growing services owned by Facebook. Two months earlier, Democratic presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren had vowed to break up Facebook and other tech giants if elected. Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden followed suit, promising tough scrutiny of Facebook, Google, and Amazon in their campaigns. Even President Trump, who used Facebook more effectively than any candidate in his presidential campaign, warned that the internet companies had too much power. The meeting with Macron was tough, as expected, yet productive from the perspective of the long game building a relationship with the French leader that could boost Facebook's reputation across Europe. Still, Zuckerberg continued to steam over Hughes's betrayal. Two days later, when a reporter for France's two television news asked for his reaction to the op-ed, he publicly addressed it for the first time. It was a gray afternoon. Ray stream, rain streamed down the windows of the television station where Zuckerberg sat for the interview. His eyebrows furrowed as he looked toward the floor. Well, when I read what I wrote, my main reaction was that what he was proposing that we do isn't going to do anything to help solve those issues, he said, his voice rising slightly. He refused to refer to Hughes by name. He didn't address any of the arguments raised by Hughes, such as the abuse of consumer privacy 
the threat of disinformation to democracy and Zuckerberg's too powerful control. Instead, he warned of an intervention to dismantle Facebook's power. If you care about, if what you care about is democracy and elections, then you want a company like us to be able to invest billions of dollars a year, like we are in building really advanced tools to fight election interference. A breakup would only make things worse, he explained. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanna ask you, we're gonna ask you if Zuckerberg's right, if a breakup would make things worse. But first I wanted, the, that passage reminded me of something. I once wrote about Google, who was putting up a Google fiber network in Kansas City where I live. So in a very small way, I mean, I'm not you know, a, a, a big time tech reporter like you, uh, but, but Google, their flax were ruthless. And, you know, like if I was going to go on the radio in Washington, they would call up the station and say, this guy's just a novelist. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You're going to be in terrible trouble if you speak with him, you know, like, and the way that the, the PR machines of these companies work, I wondered if you've ever experienced that, you know, the, the way that they were coming back at Hughes immediately after like developing a narrative about what's, how, why this is selfish and it's not, you know, like how did people react to your reporting in the past and this book? Yeah, I mean, they publicly, um, they, didn't, they haven't even had to whisper behind the scenes. They public, publicly kind of um, uh, refuted um, the book. They've, they criticize it and Facebook, um, the PR um, staff, as well as executives. And they say that, um, they say a lot of the same things they say about like the whistleblower, as well as most coverage about Facebook, that this is all cherry picking and that, you know, um, that, that we chose certain narratives, that kind of a thing. Um, so kind of the response you'd expect, I don't, I, I think it's hard for them to criticize Shira and myself because, um, I don't know, because we've been doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I, I, I hope to think that our reputations stand for, you know, stand on their own. So, um, but we understand that there's some whispering behind the scenes a bit as well. Um, but I, try not to think about it because I don't think people listen to them, you know? So I don't, if it was like effectual, then that would be problematic. But I, I think a lot of journalists are just so interested in finding out the truth and they're, they've been so incredibly um, generous and, you know, to us and we're grateful to that, for that. Just, it was interesting to me. I remember talking to one of the PR people for Google in Kansas City and they're like, oh yeah, I used to be a Wall Street Journal reporter. You know, like in other words, like these massive companies can hire really good people to attack you if you are yeah. a journalist. They'll spend a lot of money on it. Oh yeah. So Facebook has, um, you know, more had more than 200 PR people at the time of the scene, actually. Um, and it's grown significantly since then. They have a huge army of public relations people because in a lot of ways, like they're, that, that's, that's all that matters really for them is how people perceive the company. And, you know, and their messaging is so important um, for the company's growth and survival. Um, so, but, but, but yeah, we haven't, you know, the short answer is yes, it exists, but, you know, Groom. Okay, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, is Zuckerberg right? Would it help to would would a breakup of Facebook make things worse? I think it's a really intriguing question. I I don't think um, there are some very smart people who are experts in antitrust who would say that yes, it would slow down the the growth of the company, and that might be the the primary objective. But unless you address the fact that the business model is the core problem, then you could end up, let's just say if it broke up into three companies along the divided along its apps, Instagram, Facebook, and WhatsApp, then you might have three companies with the same problem, but the, still with the same problem. So what does that do? Um, there's also the argument that they wouldn't have the resources um, as three separate companies to fix things like disinformation. Um, I think those are intriguing arguments. Uh, I think that if you ask um, a lot of startups that try to compete, they would say that um, um, there's just no way to break in at this point because the network effects have been so strong for Facebook and they dominate so much. So um, from my understanding, and I've, just, I've been covering regulation and antitrust for so long, 
what I think most people in Washington believe to be true today is that it has to be a combination of antitrust and regulation that will really curtail the power of the most dominant platforms, especially Facebook. That argument that you mentioned before about um, if you break them up, but you don't sort of address the business model, you, you're going to have the same issue. I mean, Frances Haugen is one of the people saying that, isn't she? Yep, yep, yep. It's really interesting. I think she took the air out of some of the antitrust movement in Washington by doing that. I think, you know, quite frankly, I think that once she said that in her testimony in the Senate, there were people in Washington who was like, oh my God, you know, the people who've been pushing for breakup saying like, I thought she was going to be on our side. Um, so it's very intriguing to see if that politically would be the case. And so I, you know, I think it should be said that, um, that she has a very specific expertise, which is, you know, she worked on the Civic Integrity team and she was a product manager and she had like, she, her expertise is in, um, ranking systems, like the algorithms essentially. So policy may not be her expertise. That said, I think her ideas are very thoughtful and compelling and well thought out. And I, they've certainly resonated with regulators. So, um, you know, again, I think these days there's kind of the, the, the feeling that Washington and European regulators in particular have to just do like basically use the whole toolkit, like try to do regulation, antitrust enforcement, address, you know, have, um, have you maybe even create a new agency, all these different things that just looks at tech. So lots of different ideas, but I will tell you having followed this for a long time, nothing's gonna happen right away. It's gonna, ha it's gonna take some time. It's strange to exercise so much patience while at the same time eagerly awaiting likes and comments. Et cetera. Um, <laughs> so Facebook has re recently rebranded as Meta, um, and I think it's it's obvious that at least one of the hopes here is that this will divert people's attention. But Facebook did make a large investment in VR back in 2014. Yeah. You know, they purchased the Oculus VR headset, and they already had investments in similar technologies even before that. So I'm curious about your interpretation of this Meta rebranding. Yeah. So you know. Facebook has worked not only on VR and AR for quite some time, they've thought of like, they, they sort of cooked up this idea of the metaverse, like well, well before their announcement a couple of weeks ago about this rebranding. So they've been working on metaverse, this idea of a immersive world that combines real life with virtual reality and augmented reality for about more than, more than a year now. Um, and they want to own the whole platform. They want to you know, own the devices that get you into the world. They want to own the apps that are, you know, that are used to, for how we communicate and interact with each other on this world. And they want to own essentially the, the, the infrastructure, the platform itself. Um, incredibly ambitious. Um, it's hard for me to get super excited about metaverse because um, I feel like I've seen it with Roblox and like, you know, a lot of other, you know, technologies for quite some time, you know, the things that I've seen, you know, like sort of that one hour feature film felt very familiar to me. Um, but I think you, one should not underestimate um, Facebook because they have so many resources, they have so much cash. And the fact that Apple wants to get into this too and Microsoft and so many other companies says that this is, you know, this is a place where they all feel like there could be real money going forward. Um, the rebranding, so, so yes, of course they've been working on this for a while, but they also chose to announce the rebranding and the focus on this future oriented um, strategy at probably the best time for them to try to shift the conversation. So both can be true, that they're, they're sincere about this metaverse thing and they're trying to shift the conversation, the narrative away from all the problems and more toward the future. Um, I think it's gonna be really hard. Like I still don't call Facebook Meta, like the, the umbrella company, I still refer to them at Facebook. I think it'll be hard for people to, to shift in that way. I also think it's, you know, um, TPD, like whether it's a, a real thing that people get super excited about, you know, I mean, do we call Google Alphabet? We still call it Google. We call the company Google. So in a way, it doesn't really matter that it's called Meta now. The thing that you talk about, about owning the whole system, right? That's the thing when I was writing about, about Google building Google Fiber and Kansas City, I mean, the danger for me that I feel like is like, we were talking about things that should really be public infrastructure. 
and that are public spaces and that we're increasingly privatizing public spaces. And when you privatize, what you do is you lose control over them. And so in your book, which is excellent, and we, you know, shows, well, if you give up this amount of control of your public space and conversation to a private company, you run the risk of it being run by somebody like Mark Zuckerberg that is trying to profitize growth, um, prioritize growth over everything else. You can't control, you can't vote out Mark Zuckerberg. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's not a democracy, that's for sure. Um, so, and I think in addition to that thought, um, you know, he's not only prioritizing the business growth, but he's he's making some really big policy calls. He's creating the rules and the the laws and the 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 governance of of the world that he he you know he leads, which is Facebook um, and Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, and I think the most sort of um, the best illustration of why that can be problematic and in the view of many people has been problematic is his shifting views on speech. And we've seen kind of like, we're, we're almost seeing him grow up in front of our eyes and like maturing in front of our eyes and like, like vacillating with his ideas of what speech should be. So he started off with this like, real maximal free expression position, like very libertarian, where he thought more speech will conquer bad speech. So I'm gonna let politicians lie. Cause you know what? The public's gonna fact check politicians. Then he realized, oh crap. Well, if Donald Trump's, Trump is gonna like talk about like, you know, um, UV lighting is secure to COVID that might be kind of dangerous, you know? And then he kind of like backpedals a little bit. And you know, that in me, and at first he says, I, I'm gonna let all Holocaust denial exist like this anti-semitic you know semi sem semantic um content will be in the conspiracies around like the holocaust not happening that not have had happened um will be debunked by the many people on facebook who will say like no that's not true no it turns out that actually the far right like nazis like are being listened to by other far right nazis you know and they're amplifying each other and i think he's learning so then he shifted on that policy too so i think what we're seeing is like there is i think that under the reason why i mention all this is absolutely this is in so many ways facebook is, is is as powerful as a nation state and mark zuckerberg has said that himself but the difference is is that there's much more of a system of checks and balances within governments especially in democracies and not one leader with so much power. And that really surprises in our, our reporting was to see just how much he actually exercises his power. We've known for a while, we've known, we have all known that he has 54% of voting shares and that makes him very powerful and in some ways uniquely powerful compared to most CEOs. But he actually, he actually uses that power a lot. And that's, that was really surprising to, for us to see and that other executives don't hold him to account in the way that we thought they would. Cecilia, it's been so great to have you join us today, get all of this insight on a topic that's very much front of mind for me. Um, listeners, don't miss Shira Frankel and Cecilia Kong's new book, An Ugly Truth, which is out now. Uh, and thanks so much for this conversation. Thank you so much for having me.